It is my um, honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. Carol Pogorski. Carol Pogorski completed her doctoral degree in sociology and has a master's degree in public health and in marriage and family therapy. She is professor and associate chair of faculty affairs in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. She is also the director of the Finger Lakes, Finger Lakes Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease and director of Alzheimer's Disease Support Programs for the University of Rochester and the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. So it looks like Dr. Bogorski, your slides are already up. I'm gonna go ahead and mute and let you take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tara. It's my pleasure to be here today. Um, and because of the audience is, is a mix between professionals and older adults and adults from rural areas, um, the content is geared uh, to be accessible to everyone. So let's talk about depression in older adults. Oh, I'm trying to, there we go. So what I'd like to do today is talk about how common depression is in older adult populations, talk a little bit about how what symptoms of depression look like in older adults, and then talk about different interventions that people can do to reduce symptoms of depression or to help other people reduce symptoms of depression. So let's start with taking a look at what depression is. Well, there are many, many types of depression. And what I'm going to be focusing on mostly today is major depression, which is probably the most common. Um, we're gonna get into some of the diagnostic symptoms of major depression, but I just wanna call attention to a, to a little bit about the differences between these types of depression. So in major depression, you'll see that we're gonna go over nine symptoms that really characterize major depression. So for someone to meet the criteria for a diagnosis of major depression, they have to have at least five of the symptoms present during two weeks um, to a, a two week period. And the symptoms also have to result in depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure in doing things. And we'll talk more about that. The other one I wanna call attention to is persistent depressive disorder. We also used to call it dysthymia. And this is kind of a down in the dumps type of depression that occurs in people um, that it lasts usually up to two years, right? It's something that occurs most of the day uh, for more days than not. And when you think about Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, he's, he's like the, uh, the poster child for persistent depressive disorder, something that's just always a little bit down. Um, and it's always, it looks kind of like a personality trait after a while. And then there's bipolar disorder, which a lot of people um, describe people as being bipolar, but there are really stringent criteria that have to be met to, to meet the criteria for that diagnosis. So bipolar usually causes shifts in someone's mood and energy, ability to concentrate, their activity levels. They can go from feeling extremely up to extremely down. And it also significantly interferes with functioning. Now, when somebody's in a good mood in the morning and in a bad mood in the evening, that's probably not bipolar disorder. Um, a manic episode, for example, when somebody's really up, in order to meet this criteria, it has to last for at least seven days most of the day. And that's a really high bar. Um, so people often feel jumpy, um, active, they don't need any sleep, they often don't sleep. Um, they talk really fast about lots of different things and they develop excessive appetites. And, and that can be for food or drinking or sex or gambling or shopping. Um, I knew somebody once who went shopping and just started buying pens uh, somebody else was buying chapstick. 
um, people just get focused on things and um, spend a lot of money. The other thing that goes along with bipolar is the idea of feeling important or talented or powerful. So it's a very different type of depression. Seasonal affective disorder is um, some is also a, a constellation of depressive symptoms, but ones that um, usually occur when the sun doesn't shine much. And of course, postpartum depression is related to pregnancy and hormones. And situational depression is um, an example of that might be somebody entrenched in caregiving, for example. So what are those signs and symptoms of depression? Well, we often hear about persistent sadness or anxiety or just feeling empty. Sometimes people say feeling numb. Um, often people feel hopeless, guilty, worthless, helpless, irritable, restless. Um, one of the hallmark features is losing interest in things that you used to enjoy. Um, people are often feel fatigued. Um, they move or talk more slowly. They have trouble concentrating, making decisions, remembering things. Um, they also have trouble sleeping, waking up too early or oversleeping. Sometimes people can't get out of bed in the morning. The same for appetite. People can either eat more than usual or eat a lot less than usual. And the other one is often thoughts of death or suicide, or maybe even making suicide attempts. So when I talked about major depressive, depression and five symptoms, it would be five of these symptoms. So this is an optical illusion, and I wanted it to just punctuate the point that you might see something and not see it as depression, because sometimes in older adults, it looks a little bit different. So let's look at signs of depression by gender. So for women, it, it often looks more like what we think of depression looking like, feeling sad, worthless, guilty, not sleeping, but also stress is another thing associated with depression in women. And so is somatic distress, headaches, backaches, gastrointestinal issues, those kinds of things. Now in men, particularly older men, depression looks different. Um, men can present as tired, irritable, um, not having interest in doing things they used to like to do. Um, they might want to um, numb some of this pain by using alcohol or drugs. Um, they get frustrated, discouraged, angry, sometimes abusive. Personality change is common. And sometimes they have reckless behavior, driving fast, doing things, taking risks they might not have taken before. And the other one is that they are more likely to die by suicide. And I just want to deviate and veer into suicide for a second, just to um, show you this information from 2021 that looks at suicide rates among people over the age of 55. And you can see for men, look at the startling rate of 55.7%, right? For people over the age, men over the age of 85. That is the group that is most at risk for suicide. And compared to women, you can see a drastic difference. But look at how this really maps onto that sense of recklessness. And men are also more likely to use lethal means. So they're more, more likely to succeed at suicide attempts. So it's really something to be taken seriously. And because of the topic of our conference today, I also wanted to share this startling slide that looks at um, uh, death by suicide by, by gender as well as um, rural urban distinctions. And look at the male rural population is at the most extreme risk. So what are some other signs of depression in older adults? Well, memory difficulties, personality change, aches and pains. Um, fatigue, sleep problems, things that aren't caused by medication or can't be explained by a medical condition. 
right? And that's the other thing. When we're looking at depression, if somebody has these symptoms, but they're related to a medication or a medical illness, that is usually, um, physicians usually take that into account because that's a different type of presentation and, it, and people might not meet the criteria for depression. It might be just be due to a medication or medical condition. Um, people wanting to stay at home more, and this goes to what Anne-Marie was saying about loneliness and people being isolated, but when people are depressed, they might want to stay home. If they're in a senior living community, they might not want to join their friends for lunch or dinner. They might not want to try new things. And again, you see the fixations on death, whether it's suicide ideation or death ideation, more common in older adults. You might also notice that people don't care about their personal hygiene anymore. Their clothes might be stained, you know, their teeth might not be brushed, their hair isn't combed. And also they're not able to make decisions like they used to. So these are all things you can just say, this person is getting old or they're demented or whatever, but these can be signs of depression. So if you see them, it's really a good idea to probe a little bit further. So here's the lived experience of depression. These are some quotes from older adults who've experienced depression. Depression is being colorblind and constantly told how colorful the world is. Just imagine what that must feel like. There's no point treating a depressed person as though she were just feeling sad, saying, there now, hang on, you'll get over it. Sadness is more or less like a head cold. With patients, it passes. Depression is like cancer. All it takes is a beautiful fake smile to hide an injured soul, and they will never notice how broken you really are. So I think these, are, these insights are really important in making us um, be more attentive to ourselves or to other people that we care about when we start to see these signs. So here's a good question, right? Is it depression or is it just a bad day? Well, in, in making determinations about that, we look at three things. The first one is frequency. I started to allude to that before, right? Um, it's if you're just having, you know, an off day or a couple of off days, something bad happened and you're feeling down, that's not cause for alarm. But when it starts to be most of the day, nearly every day for a period of two weeks, that's starting to meet the criteria for a major depressive disorder. The same for intensity. You can feel bad or guilty, but if you feel bad or guilty or worthless or to the point that it starts affecting your functioning, that's a different issue. That requires a closer look. And the other one, as I said, is duration. How long does it last? So how do we measure that? Well, one thing we do is use the patient health questionnaire. And some of you might have completed this in your doctor's offices. It's a standard of practice. Isn't always done, but it's a good standard of practice. And there's a screen. This is the screen for two questions. And it asks over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by the following? Little interest or pleasure in doing things or feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. Again, those are the two hallmark features of a major depressive disorder. And then you'll see um, not at all, several days, more than half, nearly every day. Again, we're looking at duration. And then uh, there's a question that says, how often um, have, the, have, well, you'll see in the next one, this is the PHQ-9, which is those same, it's, I apologize for the smallness, but it's the same symptoms I talked about before. But it has one question on the bottom that says, if you checked any of these symptoms, how difficult have these problems made it for you to do your work, take care of other things, or get along with other people. So that's getting to the point of, does it interfere with your function? So those are the three things that we look at when we're determining if somebody is in a major depressive episode. So what do those scores mean on the PHQ? So 
um, if you score between zero and four, it means that you're probably normal. We don't need to worry about it. If someone scores between five and nine, that is in the mild range. And usually a physician will just keep an eye on it. It might be a situational depression, might just be a bad day. Um, and it's just something that it's a good idea to repeat the PHQ in another two weeks. 10 to 14 is moderate. And this is when physicians will generally develop a treatment plan or uh, talk with a patient about maybe seeking further services, um, considering counseling, psychotherapy. And this is when, when physicians will start to think about prescribing medication. Medication for someone between five and nine is probably not gonna be all that helpful. And it's not usually a standard of care to think about it until someone reaches the moderate range. Um, and 15 to 19 is moderately severe, where um, this is where somebody would definitely take, uh, have a treatment plan for active treatment with um, medication and or psychotherapy, usually both. And between 20 and 27 is severe. And this is somebody's probably barely functioning. Um, and this would generally call for the initiation of medication or um, maybe some other type of medical intervention. So how common is depression? Well, this looks at depression by age with the blue, the navy blue being age 18 to 29 and the bars over to the right being 65 and older. So for any severity, you'll see that the young adults have the highest percentage at 21 and older adults at 18.4. But in our population, regardless of age, there's really significant rates of depression. Um, and so when you think if, if we have 62 million people over the age of 62, of 65 in our country, 18% is a considerable number of those people. So you'll see that a lot of people have mild and older adults, it's about 12%. And then look at, at severe, if it's 2.6%, that's like 1.5 million people are affected by that in the country. And in this um, picture, we're looking at distributions of severity by race and ethnicity. So the navy blue one is Hispanic, um, then non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, and non-Hispanic Asian. And you'll see in the first one, with looking at any severity, that the highest rates are among non-Hispanic whites and non-Hispanic blacks. And um, they stay, uh, those two groups experience the highest rates of depression also at mild, moderate, and severe. This graph is a look, is a look at prevalence of major depression by um, overall with, with a rate of 8.3%. And then by gender, you'll see women 10%, men about 6%. This is for all ages. Then when we break it down by age, again, you'll see that the highest rates are among the young adults with the 50 plus dropping to 4.5%. And then we have a distribution across ethnicity. So this one is comparing older adults by male and female. And this is looking at geriatric depression scale scores. And you'll see that um, looking at normal, again, those rates, 78% um, normal men. And for women, 68% without depression. So when we look at mild, there are more women with mild depression. And it evens out a little bit at mild to severe with almost 6% for men, <clears throat> excuse me, and women in the um, category of moderate to severe depression. This is a look at adults of all ages who have, who are um, LGBT. 
And it shows here that no matter what age group um, people from this population are in, the rates of depression are considerably higher than their counterparts in all age groups. This is a nice picture of um, rates of depression by per 100,000 adults across the country. And you can see New York State, and we are actually a state that is in the lowest, um, the lowest prevalence rates, even though our rates of depression are very high, we actually have uh, among the lowest rates in the country. So let's dig a little deeper into um, our region. Um, so people who've reported poor mental health, if we look at it by income, you can see that um, the lower the income, the higher the rates of depression. The last one that got kind of cut off is over 75,000. So people making over 75,000, the rates of depression are still 6%. But for people under 20,000, it's almost a quarter of the population. And here again, if we look by race and ethnicity for the Finger Lakes region, we'll see that um, it's highest for whites, followed by African Americans and Latinos again, as in the previous slides, um, show up with the lowest prevalence rates. Now, if we compare rural and urban, we'll see that rural and urban look about the same with suburban being just a shade less. And this one is percent of population with a depressive disorder by each county in our Finger Lakes region. And the blue bar is data from 2016 and the green bar are data from 2018. And you'll see in almost every county, the rate of depression increased between 26 and 2018. And if we had a graph, this similar graph with more current data, I suspect that the trend would continue because we know that depression rates post COVID have increased. Um, this one shows us that the highest rates of depression are in Livingston County, followed by Steuben and uh, Wayne County closely following behind. And we also see that um, the lowest rates of depression seem to be um, in, well, Monroe County seems to have a low rates, Yates County. Um, and Seneca County had a drastic increase in depression rates in those two years. So I thought that was interesting to look at. If we look by type of health insurance, we see that people who have no insurance have a pretty high above the average rate. People on Medicaid have the highest rates. Again, this could be tied to the income and people with private insurance are about 10%. The New York State Health Foundation uh, produced a wonderful report about the ongoing impact of COVID on mental health. And I just wanna share some data from that. So there are four bars you'll see that from the orange, dark orange, bright orange to the pale orange. Those are the years, 2021, 22, and 23. So the pale bar is 2023. And you can see here the annual anxiety and or depression rates by income group. And once again, we'll see that um, even people making over $100,000 still have almost a quarter of people reporting depression. And then if we look at the people with less than 25,000, the rates are double. So they're not low even for those over 100,000, but they're staggering for people making less than 25,000 household income. Looking at those same rates by age, this compares young, young adults, middle-aged adults, and people over the age of 65. And this one shows us that um, about a quarter of the over 65 population are reporting anxiety and depression. This one looks at race and ethnicity. And 
In this one, you'll see a different number than what we've seen before. And I think what's interesting, remember, we didn't see the Hispanic rates as being very high for depression. But what's different about this picture is that it includes anxiety. So when we include anxiety into the mix, look at what happens to the numbers of Hispanics. It's higher than ever, whereas they hardly show up as depressed at all. So that tells us we have to look for something different when we're working with Latino populations. And this one I thought was interesting, which is a look at these rates by food sufficiency. So you can see the rate of depression and anxiety is almost double for people who report that they don't have sufficient food available to them. Now let's talk a little bit about rural and urban differences. So this was um, a study that was published in 2024 and um, it looks at older adults over the age of 80 living in rural communities and showed that those older adults reported a higher prevalence of depression compared to urban. So that was a comparison of 49% to 33%. The other thing we need to look at is the lack of mental health providers. Um, this was another study done in 2020 that said that nearly 65% of counties considered non-metropolitan do not have psychiatrists, nearly 65%. And over 60% of rural Americans live in a designated mental health provider shortage area, another staggering number. And we also know that specialty mental health services are scarce, which contributes to these disparities in care. This is a picture of what mental health professional shortage areas look like in our Finger Lakes region, with the dark blue being a designated shortage area. Maps onto that national study very well. So what else can affect mood in older adults? Well, one thing we often think about, I work in the memory care program at the University of Rochester, and sometimes we get referrals for people and we're trying to figure out if they have depression or if they have dementia. So often we'll work with the primary care office to say, let's try treating the depression to see if the cognitive impairment changes. So there's definitely an overlap between depression and dementia. And I think it's important for us to just look at that. So how about the onset? The onset of depression can be between weeks and months. The onset of dementia is months to years, right? The mood in depression is low with apathy. In depression, it's more likely to fluctuate. Um, the course of depression is chronic and it responds to treatment. And in dementia, it's chronic, but doesn't, uh, but deteriorates over time, doesn't always respond to treatment. Um, in terms of self-awareness, people with depression are likely to be concerned about memory impairment. We often hear that among dementia caregivers as well, that they think they're not as sharp as they used to be and that caregiver burden is really interfering with their ability to remember and be as sharp as they used to be. And in dementia, dementia they're more likely to hide or be unaware of these cognitive deficits. So I think it's important um, when people start to show memory loss, this is why we always say that getting a diagnosis is important because depression is one of the explanations for um, reversible memory loss, right? Because depression can show up like memory loss, it can be treated and the memory loss can resolve. Whereas in dementia, that is not the case. As I just mentioned, family caregiving can also, caregiver burden can look like depression. So here was a study from 2020 that found that caregivers had a higher risk, a 1.2 times greater risk of having depression than non-caregivers. And they had higher levels of depression pre-COVID at 16% compared to 12 non-caregivers. 
And during the pandemic, it went up to 21% compared to 18% non-caregivers. The loneliness associated with caregiving also increases the risk of depression fourfold in caregivers. They have a 3.85 greater likelihood of being depressed if they're lonely than if they're not lonely. The good news is that when they access therapy, it attenuates the risk of depression. And this one is more um, disappointing or discouraging that 60% of caregivers with depression said that they don't or didn't access any therapeutic support during the pandemic. Another thing that affects um, depression is sensory impairment. Uh, there was a study, this one was done here in, in Rochester, looking at um, clinically significant depression and anxiety symptoms in people with auditory impairment, vision impairment, or dual, meaning both. So you can see for auditory impairment, 21% um, depression, 22% anxiety for vision, it jumped up to 28% and 23%. And for dual, look at those numbers, 46% people had depression and anxiety and 36% than in older adults with no auditory or vision impairment. Uh, the other interesting thing about this study it said older adults with auditory and or vision impairment were older, more likely to be widowed or never married had less formal education and had higher um, medical comorbidities and more impairment in their daily function. Another thing we talked about was loneliness. Older adults living alone were more likely to feel anxious, 38%, or depressed, 27%, um, than compared to people without, um, who didn't live alone. Another thing that gets confused with depression is grief. And grief is a, is a different thing. And the diagnostic manual for a diagnostic and statistical manual for diagnosing mental disorders specifies that you have to look at grief very differently and that you can't say that grief and depression are the same things. So they describe grief as being like a roller coaster, and there's a lot of emotions. If any of you have ever been to a, a funeral home, calling hours, someone's home after someone passes, you usually do see a mix of emotions there because people are recalling good times and being sad over the loss. And there is definitely a fluctuation of how people are feeling. Um, so even when people are grieving, they're able to have moments of pleasure or happiness. And if we think back on the diagnosis of depression, we saw that there's not as much fluctuation in depression. Um, right, those, those feelings are constant. And while there's no timetable for grieving, it doesn't, if it doesn't let up over time, then it might be depression. So um, there's also grief. And when it gets into what we call complicated grief about lasting perhaps between one and three years, that might be time for um, intervention. So what do we know about attitudes about depression? Well, here is a study from Mental Health America that looked at how older adults feel about depression. And what they found in their survey was that almost 70% of older adults know very little or nothing about depression. About 40% of older adults believe um, that depression is a health problem. That's less than half people thinking that it's a health problem when we know that it indeed is. If suffering from depression, older adults are more likely than any other group to want to take care of it by themselves. They don't want to seek help. Only 42% said that they would seek help. And signs of depression are mentioned more frequently by people under age 64 than by people over age 65. 
And the last bullet there says almost 60% of older adults believe that it's normal for people to get depressed as they grow older. In reality, that's not true. In reality, studies that have looked at life satisfaction have found that people over the age of 75 happen to be the people who are most satisfied with their lives. Here's another study done in 2020 that said that um, depression was viewed as a normal reaction to life stressors and aging. Again, this one corroborated the previous study and said that older adults prefer to manage things by themselves than to seek out help. Um, and that um, professional interventions were sometimes considered necessary for severe depression, uh, but a lot, of per, a lot of people didn't really have a lot of faith that professional intervention would make a difference. Um, there was a willingness to try treatment, but it was based on different um, values, different cultural beliefs, um, and a lot of people thought that there was a potential for harm. I've often seen in older adults, if they start an antidepressant medication, if they take it and have one symptom that day or the next day, they're not taking it anymore. Whereas the physician and the prescribing materials will usually say, you have to give it a couple of days till your system gets used to it. Older adults are less likely to give it a couple of days. So we know that there are also societal and um, cultural attitudes about depression and we know that in our society we often think of course all older adults would be depressed um i think i said all those other things all right so what does depression look like well we know depression to look like this right but we now also know that we can look deeper into the brain and that even though we see things on the outside, we now have a way to look at the brain to see the effects of depression on the brain. So remember when people are always saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, everybody has a bad day. Okay, everybody does have a bad day. But now we have the technology through brain imaging to show that depression actually makes a difference. So here's a brain scan, and this shows that there's evidence in several parts of the brain of that the brain actually shrinks in people with depression. So in people who have had lifelong episodes of depression or many episodes of major depression, they're likely to lose gray matter or volume of their brain. Their brains shrink. That means that they're losing brain cells. And it particularly happens in those regions of the brain called the hippocampus, which is responsible for learning and memory, and in the prefrontal cortex, which is the part responsible for thinking or planning or doing complex tasks or sequencing things. Here is a picture of a PET scan of a depressed brain on the left and a non-depressed brain on the right. Look at how the regions on the right are more alive and working and how all those regions in the depressed brain are really inert. So if we look at the, uh, this just uh, cartoon of the brain, we see all the things that the brain is responsible for. So if we look at those regions in the depressed brain that aren't working, you can see how it would show up in thinking or our memory could show that it's impaired. It might look impaired. It could affect your heart rate, your temperature, your language, balance, how you're feeling, your emotions, all of those things. And now these PET scans can show us that it's a real thing. The other thing that we see is that in people who are depressed, there's inflammation in their brains. So it's not only how they look on the outside, but we can actually tell now um, the, the actual biological effects. So what do we do about this? Well, we have to rewire the brains, okay? And 
what I've, how I've organized this presentation is to start with self-management strategies and then going toward things that require more intervention. So I'm spending more time on self-management strategies because the evidence told us, as we saw a few slides ago, that older adults are more likely to try to take care of things themselves. So if you are an older adult struggling with depression or you know of an older adult or work with older adults and they're reluctant to go for help, the things we're gonna talk about now are things that you might be able to do to help people rewire their brain. So first let's look at the behavioral activation cycle. So if we look on the left, we see that um, social isolation, for example, leads to sad mood, which then leads to low energy. And then that leads to avoiding doing things that we used to do, which again leads to social isolation and it positively reinforces this negative pattern. And what happens if we start socially integrating people, we see that the mood improves, energy improves, and there's more engagement in meaningful activities, which makes people feel better about themselves and more likely to get more involved socially. And you can see how it goes. So sometimes we say, people have to get activated. And that's one of the first thing, there was a, um, a study by the MacArthur Foundation years ago that said that one of the first things that we had to do was behavioral activation. And some of you might have heard of the pleasant event scale. That was something that came out of that work that said, let's give people a list of pleasant events or things that they might be able to do just to start getting those regions of the brain that aren't lit up to light up. So part of this has to do with neuroplasticity of the brain. So we know that depression causes the loss of synapses in the brain. Synapses are those things that, are, that connect the brain, that connect the regions of the brain. And if we lose them, that's why our brain stops functioning like we saw in that PET scan. But one thing that we know is that the brain has the capacity to continue to grow in response to life experience. So we have to consider the brain to be like a muscle and we can train it and we can strengthen it. So our ability to adapt or change by creating new neurons is possible by activating, take, doing some behavioral activation. So what do we know about how the brain benefits from adaptation? Well, we know that brains can recover from strokes, right? It takes a lot of hard, hard work, but it is possible to get to restore some recovery. We've seen people recover from traumatic brain injuries. Um, people have been able to rewire functions I don't know if any of you have ever seen stories like on 60 Minutes or any of those shows that show that after an auto accident or a TBI, somebody might end up um, being a prodigy in music or in art or how the brain was damaged in one way, the brain started to compensate for what it lost by developing um, areas of expertise in something else. And those are startling examples of neuroplasticity. Um, so that's losing function in one area of the brain may enhance functions in the other. Um, this adaptation may enhance our memory abilities and our cognitive abilities and help us to learn more effectively. Sometimes we think older adults can't learn as well as younger adults. But what we know is older adults take more time to learn information, so they're more likely to remember it than younger adults who can learn things more quickly. So how do we promote neuroplasticity? This goes into the this, this, um, trying to manage depression yourself bucket. So participating in positive social interactions, trying new activities. Uh, there's actually quite a, a base of literature, a base of evidence developing now that 
playing video games for older adults is one of the best ways to promote neuroplasticity. And you can just imagine playing games with grandchildren and connecting with them around things like this would have other positive effects as well. Um, finding stimulating environments or settings to put yourself in, um, participating in mindfulness meditation, seeking a purpose in life. So I have to pause now and say, sounds great, but when your brain looks like that one in the PET scan, how on earth is it possible to do this when somebody can't find a reason to get out of bed in the morning? That's why we have to set our expectations low and start with just doing one thing. Take a walk around the block. Um, just start with the most basic of things, making a phone call. Um, and any one of those things is going to start getting the neurons to start connecting. But we have to understand that you can't go from zero to 60 in this. These things take a lot of time when somebody's brain is really not functioning. So here are some other things that have been found to promote neuroplasticity. Intermittent fasting. You might have heard about that. That's when people reduce the number of hours between meals. Um, or I'm sorry, increase the number of hours between meals to maybe up to um, 12 or 16. Um, that's found to increase this synaptic adaptation and help new neurons to grow. Of course, I wouldn't do that without consulting a physician because that could really be a problem for medications or other medical conditions, but it is something that can have an impact on the brain. Traveling, and it doesn't mean you have to travel, you know, to Europe or Africa, right? But traveling even a town over or a county over, we have beautiful places in the Finger Lakes to visit. That exposes your brain to new stimuli and new environments. I don't know how many of you remember Jack LaLanne. He lived to be 95. And one of the things he said that the secret to, to longevity was for him was changing something in his routine every two weeks, even if it was just driving to the grocery store, taking a different route. Whenever you do that, you're not relying on your brain's memory, you're introducing new stimuli that your brain has to work to process. So traveling is a great way to do that. Another way to do that is to use mnemonic devices or memory aids, right? Like when you're trying to remember somebody's names, uh, you might put it to a song or create an acronym for something you're trying to remember. If you want to create an acronym for the uh, items on the grocery list that you're trying to do, but just trying to use these memory aids also um, increases neuroplasticity. Learning a musical instrument or a foreign language helps create, create connectivity. And we also have programs like Oasis or in Rochester, the Osher Center, or there's a lot of online things too, where people can actually learn these things in the company of other people where you're getting um, double benefit. Non-dominant hand, this goes to the Jack LaLanne thing too, right? Try brushing your teeth with your other hand right? Try doing something different, again, just to rewire your brain. Try signing your name with your other hand. Anything that's going to challenge your brain. Reading fiction. Some of us might be attracted to watching the news and reading news, but reading fiction has been found to increase connectivity in the brain. Expanding your vocabulary works on your memory processing. Artwork is a great thing to do. Even adult coloring books are a great thing to do um, because they, they create a lot of things. They're also a nice way for self, a nice means for self-expression. Dancing is probably one of the best ways to do this, especially if you're dancing with a partner and remembering music that makes you feel good, um, connects many regions of the brain. And sleep is important to all of these things because we know now that sleeping, deep REM sleep, gets rid of toxins in your brain and it encourages learning retention. So for those people who don't want to seek help for depression and want to do things on their own, 
these are a, this is a whole list of wonderful things to try, but sometimes they might not be enough. So then let's talk about psychotherapy. And a lot of people think, what's the point? It's just talking. Well, psychotherapy has also been found to promote neuroplasticity. It fosters resilience and imaging studies have shown that it also can produce lasting changes in the brain. So in psychotherapy, for the most part, uh, this is a cognitive behavioral model, but the elements are the same often for other types of psychotherapy. You're looking at the relationship between your thoughts and our thoughts create feelings, our feelings create behavior, our behaviors reinforce our thoughts. And if you can change any one of these, if you're having thoughts that are not helpful and they're contributing to bad feelings, then it might be helpful to talk to somebody who can challenge those thoughts that you're having to think, you know what, let's think about times that you weren't having those thoughts or if people who loved you were here in this room with you, would they think that the things you're thinking about yourself are true? Do they see you in the same way you see yourself? One of the questions I always ask people is, um, what did teachers say on your report card? What did your supervisors write on your performance evaluations? Try to get other people's voices into the room to challenge people's negative self-thought. So there are different types of psychotherapy that are effective for older adults. We just talked about cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, another one is called acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT. And this one works especially well with older adults to accept components of life that are beyond your control. Sometimes we don't want to, um, you know, it's very difficult to accept that we don't have control over things. So the best way we can cope in life is to, pro is to solve the problems we can solve and learn to accept the things that are beyond our control. ACT teaches people to focus on their resources to try to do that. And also it's very value-based. So it's focused on taking action that are consistent with someone's core values. Problem-solving therapy is something we don't hear about too much, but it's something that works particularly well in older men who like don't wanna talk about feelings so much, but problem solving therapy is a cognitive behavioral intervention geared to improve somebody's ability to cope with stressful life experiences. For example, you can say, um, what's a goal you want to work on? Let's think of all the possible ways we could get to that goal. Okay, now let's think about which of those are feasible or likely to happen. Which are What are the barriers going to be? It breaks down problem solving into steps. And I, I have witnessed that particularly older adult men enjoy that. Then there's mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which tries to interrupt those negative um, self-thoughts and the rumination that keeps people awake all night. Interpersonal therapy and family therapy both work to improve your relationship with other people because often depression um, has at its root um, some kind of disconnection or distress caused by interpersonal relationships. Then there's reminiscence therapy that provides perspective and acceptance of one's life, including resolution of past conflicts. It's also been found to be very helpful in helping older adults create a narrative that they want to share about their life with other people. And we also know there's value to art therapy and music therapy going back to the neuroplasticity. Not going to talk about medication because I wanted to focus on non-pharmacological interventions. But again, when someone scores higher than 10 on the patient health questionnaire, it's a good idea for a physician or a health care provider to ask about that. Then there are brain stimulation therapies. And I'm not going to get into too much about this. But when those other things don't work, sometimes there's treatment resistant depression. And now there is a whole new um, type of stimulation therapies, a whole new domain of the treatments 
involving dream, brain stimulation. And these use electricity and implants or magnets to trigger brain activity. Again, trying to get those depressed regions, those blue, blue regions of the brain to turn yellow. Um, deep brain stimulation is a surgical procedure. Um, it places electrodes in the brain that de delivers a low impulse, a low level impulse. Then TMS is a new, newer one, a transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is non-invasive. And then there's vagus nerve stimulation. Again, these are used when nothing else, courses of other medications, many types of courses of medications haven't worked. Um, so what is the likelihood it's going to work? Well, the New York Times says you're not too old to talk to somebody, and they reported on studies that found that therapy can be helpful in older adults. Another one, older adults respond better to psychological therapy than working age adults. And talk therapy may improve depression and anxiety in people with dementia. So there is an evidence base and it's much larger than this slide suggests that shows that it does work. So who can treat depression? Where do you go when you decide that you need help? Well, Psychiatrists prescribe medication. Psychiatrists sometimes also work on psychotherapy, but um, it's not as often and it's often very expensive, but they're mostly prescribing providers, um, but not exclusively. Psychologists also can do all those types of therapy that I talked about, but they also can do neuropsychological evaluations to try to do um, batteries of testing to help with diagnosis when it's not clear, for example, if something is depression versus dementia, or if somebody has attention deficit disorder, if, is it a concentration issue? Psychologists can help ferret those things out. Nurse practitioners can also prescribe medications as psychiatrists can. They're also happen to be more of them in rural areas, so there's more access to prescribers if you use nurse practitioners. Then there's um, licensed clinical social workers. Uh, and LCSWs, marriage and family therapists, and mental health counselors are all master's prepared uh, clinicians. And they all have a little bit of a different focus on how they do their work, but they're all um, licensed in New York State to be able to diagnose, assess, and treat um, mental illnesses. Then there's also a whole class of creative arts therapists. We often find them more in residential care settings here, but they are in the community as well and also do amazing work with older adults with depression. Pastoral counselors are not licensed providers in New York State, but some people find them very helpful, and many pastoral counselors do have some training in um, helping people with uh, mental health issues. So the other things that can help are pets. Pets are a great source of support and can help people become more activated, give people a sense of purpose. Um, family members can also help by pushing people into those activities that promote neuroplasticity and behavioral activation. Neighbors can be a great source of help, and so can senior centers and friends. Here's um, a list of resources where you might be able to find some help. And that's it. Hi, Dr. Pogorski, thank you so much. I don't know if you can see the reactions. Um, lots of thumbs up and hearts and the reactions and a lot of good conversation in the chat, um, which we won't take the time to reiterate today, but I hope that you're able to stay on and see um, some of the conversation, especially among some of our OT providers that joined us today. Uh, good, yes. Yeah. We have 10 questions in the chat and only a couple of minutes before we take yeah. our next break. So sorry about that. I got carried away. No, not at all. It's such a great presentation and 
we needed that information. So I think we'll take a couple and then if you are okay with it, we'll email you the one. Absolutely. Ones I left my me. email here and it right. Absolutely. Okay. So we'll jump right in for just a couple minutes. Could the higher rates of depression by race be partially due to the fact that non-Hispanic whites have better access and are more likely to access treatment and get a diagnosis other than racial groups? I think that's an excellent observation and it's likely to be true. Part of the problem is we do not have many Spanish speaking providers. The University of Rochester does have a clinic called Lazos Fuertes, which means strong ties. And, um, but, and there also is a neurologist that um, provides Spanish speaking services, but there really is very much a shortage. So I think that absolutely could account for it, but I also think there are cultural influences as well. Awesome, thank you so much. We'll have time for one more. Can you please share any resources you are aware of in regard to mental health services for individuals who do not have health insurance? Uh, yes, um, I think, that some of the places that I suggested on the resource slide might do that. If people are in this area, I know that um, St. Joseph's Neighborhood Center is one of those places that provides mental health services for people without health insurance. And um, I'm sure that would also be a resource to tell people where else they might be able to go because I'm sure they're connected to other places. Um, but I would start there. All righty. Very good. Thank you so much for being with us today. This information obviously resonated with our audience very highly. And I'm seeing lots of applause and, and notes of appreciation in the chat. There were several questions that we didn't have time to get to today. So yep. we will forward those to Dr. Bogorski after the conference and make sure that those are made available. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. It's always nice to see you. You too. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions you send to me. Okay. Thank you kindly. Have a wonderful rest of your Friday and a good weekend. I think we're going to see Thanks. the sun, Dr. Bogorski. Take care.